Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hello and welcome to the Counselling Tutor podcast with me, Rory Lees Oaks. And with me, as always, my my fellow traveller in everything existential, therapeutic and organismic valuing, Mr. Ken Kelly. (laughs) So many words. I'm feeling tickety-boo. Now I'm thinking of all all of those academic words and then my tickety-boo-ness. This is episode 94, Counselling Tutor podcast. What can you expect today? Great episode planned for you. The first uh, question we're going to be covering is, can we as counsellors be totally unbiased towards our uh, clients? So that's an interesting topic we're going to be uh, looking into. Practice matters today really uh, important and something brand new and that is GDPR or general data protection regulation you're going to be discussing that Rory I am I'm going to be talking um, about what I do in terms of GDPR in my practice and some of the things that I've had to um, consider as before the law came in and uh, I'm going to share that um, with people and also I'm going to do a super duper handout just a checklist, a GDPR checklist is what I'm going to do. Ooh. So if you're if you're still considering if you if you complied with GDPR, I'm going to do a, a literally a checklist that you can download and just see if um, if if you're complying to to the legislation because it came in. I think it was the 28th, 25th of May, 2018, and everybody has to obey the law. Yeah, and it's a law that affects anybody that is uh, uh, collecting data within the the EU. Uh, so if you're outside of the EU, this won't relate to you, uh, but it's still worth having a listening listen to. And as counsellors, it does affect the way that we may keep records and uh, our clients' data. So really important and looking forward to that handout. And then we're going to end episode 94 by speaking about feeling judged by our personal counsellors. So many courses here in the UK uh, require that a therapist attend their own private counselling while they are studying uh, to be able to, to be interested perspective look at self and and a guess at some level see what that feels like to to be a client uh, so the question there feeling judged by your personal therapist something we've taken from our facebook group rory yes and if you're not sure what our facebook group is if you're a first time listener maybe um if you go into facebook type counseling tutor you'll see us there we are a closed group but we're a friendly group over twenty thousand people Whoa! oh in there <laughs> Um, it's, it, there's a big party going on. If you put your ear to the door, you can hear the, you can hear the bass drum going off. And uh, that's the one, yes. And um, if you just knock on the door, we'll let you in. It's wonderfully moderated by a wonderful moderation team. So it keeps it nice and safe and on topic uh, for those who are interested in the world of counsellors psychotherapy. So come and join us. And that question was asked. That's where we got our questions from. We draw our questions from the podcast from what we observe and what we see in that Facebook group. So come and join us. Yeah, it means that your voice kind of steers what we discuss and where we go. You are our listener. We are in service of you. And uh, question one today is no exceptional topic one, I guess. It, it did come as a question from the Facebook group. Can we be totally unbiased as a counsellor towards our clients? Oh, Rory, can we? Well, it's an interesting one. The, the actual, the full question was, can we be truly non-biased? And it said, you know, what about people who may be LGBT um, people, you know, people from the, what would be called, I guess, the gay community, um, you know, people from a religious perspective or have a faith position, people may be dis- disabled, different culture. And if you're, and the question actually said, if you're a Western heterosexual practicing Christian, working ethically with non-maleficence, in other words, doing no harm to the clients. So that's an interesting one, isn't it? And the first thing I thought of when I saw that question is that, you know, clients wouldn't necessarily know too much about us. You know, no one would know if I had a faith position or not, and no one would know really my sexuality or not. Um, but it is an interesting question, and sometimes I think we could we could trip over um, very – there's tripwires we can trip over. Shall I give you an example? Yeah, go, go. I, I was recent. I was recently tell, uh, speaking to someone who said they were having an Afro-Caribbean client come to see them. And I said, oh, right, okay. And actually, Afro is a hairstyle. Yeah. The, the term is African-Caribbean. 
And um, I know you can go past shops. I know you can go past shops that have Afro-Caribbean food. But actually, the term is African-Caribbean. And to some um, to some people of, of, of you know who are African-Caribbean folk, that can that could be quite discounting. I've, 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 I've known one or two people in my time have said it's not Afro. Afro is a hairstyle. It's African-Caribbean. And it's, it's really useful to be precise and and to gain knowledge on different cultures of course we can't be educated in every single culture but we we have to be thoughtful and if we maybe having a client who comes from a frame of reference or a place that we we know nothing about might be worth doing some consultative work and doing some research and getting some kind of background um on you know from 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 that and and of course that doesn't mean that we stereotype it's it's a, it is a bit of a tightrope mm. because not every not every gay client will like musicals <laughs> you know that's a stereotype isn't it and and not not everybody who, who comes from a faith position will know their text back to front and inside out but we just have to have to be thoughtful i guess it's just about listening to the clients and seeing where they are it comes down to that all the time ken listening mm. to the client 100 percent, could not agree more and, and and it's interesting how uh as you kind of led into this a label was used to describe a client that might be coming because it is a label as soon as we say yes. hey you know what oh i'm working with a client who may be disabled i'm putting a label that is a person and has the same kind of feelings and emotions as any other person why the label is i'm asking this of myself i'm not asking this of anybody else and i think yeah. these topics are important to discuss because it does get us to ask questions of ourselves one of my favorite programs because uh, i find it hilariously funny is a program running in the uk and it's called the last leg and it's uh, it, it's just been covering the invictus games that have been having happening in in australia at the moment and they have have a right laugh about disability and and, and the presenters are, are are disabled say say for one and they have a good good laugh about it. and it's interesting where they go uh, with their chats and topics and i wonder if that if they can go further than somebody that may be considered able body might be able to go there, there are times where i go oh interesting thin ice there uh, but they happily go there and they have a real good laugh and they just see one another as people yeah and and I, you make a very good point, Ken, and I think the person, the person who asked the question was asking it for all the right reasons. The question was being asked about not quite sure what to do, not quite sure what to say, first time maybe um, of engaging with a client from that community. And it, it came, and I think a lot, a lot of the times we stumble is because people with people who are reasonable people don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, and sometimes in that, in that we can audit ourselves and uh, I'll share, I'll share when, when I was a uh, support worker, I worked with people in the community, in their homes who had uh, what would be cl classed as, as mental health problems. They were given a diagnosis. I was a support worker and I had someone who was schizophrenic and he was laughing and joking on the back of the bus about hearing voices and, um, and seeing things. And uh, he said, you know, he said, I'm a, he said, I'm as mad as a box of frogs. And I'm sitting there thinking, Oh my goodness! I couldn't possibly say that. And even when he was well, he would say that. Yeah. But if for someone else to say it, would would be of course rude. It it is difficult, and it comes down. It's exactly what you say, Ken. It comes down to knowing your client and building that relationship, and being able to understand where they are. It's it's a, it comes down to knowing somebody. I agree. I think it also comes down to knowing yourself. And w what are the the words that might bring up that twinge within you where you kind of go? Because obviously when, when this uh, person said happily and with a smile on their face, oh, I'm as mad as a box of fro frogs. Inside you, Rory, it sounds like there was a little, ooh. Do I laugh at that? <laughs> yeah. Do I laugh at that? Yes. Do, do I say, oh, don't say that about yourself? It was a real. It was it was a really uncomfortable place. Yeah, and and I think a good a good thing a good way to look at it was. It, and I was taught this in training. If you, I'm I'm broadcasting from Manchester in the UK, and of course we've got a big football heritage here. We've got two really opposing teams: Manchester United and Manchester City. Um, and I think the, the best way to do it would be if you had if you're a Manchester United supporter and you had to work with a Manchester City supporter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, what what would you what would you need to consider? Yeah. Well, how how would you? Where's the and it comes down to the common ground, knowing yourself and the common ground. Where's the common ground? Like, and it. that's humanity. 
It is, and and it's a fellow human that that feels and experiences pain and and experiences emotions, and and that's what we see. And it, unconditional positive regard is the word that comes to mind. Rogers wrote extensively on that, and I, I love the the analogy he uses where he describes unconditional positive regard as looking at as a at a sunset. A sunset is just a sunset. When we watch a sunset, we go, "Oh, there is a sunset." We don't go, "Oh, there is a sunset." It would be nice if it had a little bit more red in. Oh, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a bit strange that sunset today i'm feeling uneasy it just is there can be so many different sunsets and we just experience them as a sunset can we not experience people the same and keeping with the theory uh, what does the theory say with working with people uh, of diversity someone who may have a different path different road different skin color different thoughts beliefs to yourself and i don't remember any of the theorists mentioning anything on this the theory is the theory because the theory links to the human condition so if you're looking at person centers it says that the core conditions or the, the all all six of the conditions are necessary and sufficient it doesn't say necessary and sufficient unless that person happens to be of a different faith base to you Absolutely, Ken. And actually, actually, Roger's later work was all about working with difference. He he he, he was he was um, selected for a Nobel Prize on his work in Russia and Beirut and Northern Ireland, where he brought different communities together to try and find a common ground. And he he, he developed what, what now we know as the personal development group. They were called encounter groups back in the back in the seventies, and he did fantastic work. Just by people sitting and saying, "I don't know you, but this is how I experience you," and and if you if you watch any of the encounter group work that Rogers does, it's 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 really fantastic. It's seeing someone as a human being first and foremost, and and I think you know that sometimes is something that's missed in this world where there's labels and you know sometimes it's called political correctness. It's seeing someone as a human being first and foremost. We must never miss that. Oh, that that is so well said, and uh, and and a part part of that is knowing yourself, as we've already said, mm -hmm. and knowing what your 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 trigger points are, knowing who you can and cannot work with. If if you have been um, in a, an abusive relationship where you've been on the re receiving age of uh, receiving end of abuse, and and you end in a client work with a client who is maybe an abuser, are you able to do that? It's really looking honestly at self, and it's having these uncomfortable conversations. I mean, even Rory. I know that within this conversation with our podcast, both of us have kind of ooh, we did, and looked carefully where we're st stepping, but we're having the conversation. And I think that's important. Have this conversation with your peers. Uh, have, have it in your, your learning institution. Don't hide it away. If you're wondering, have it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and also, one plea, do not be frightened of making a mistake because sometimes you can say something which is quite innocuous, and and it might it might be taken in a different way. Work with that, you know. Working with misunderstanding, I think, is is a wonderful thing because it's how we understand. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't do anything, if we become defensive and and kind of step back when working with someone with difference, we're never going to get into the therapeutic relationship. So so you know, I'm, I may very well admit to the clients you know, who's talking about what's going on for them. So I, you know, I really, mm. I really have not experienced that as a male therapist. I will sometimes say to my female clients, you know, I, I have to own that I, I don't experience the world as you do because we know that women, women's experience of the world is different to men's. And I find that that, that that's, that has been incredibly useful. I've got to say it's been incredibly useful to deepen the therapeutic relationship. Mm. We're all human. Counselors are human. We we hold our own truths. And the question being, uh, can we be totally unbiased? And I look at the counseling relationship as a very special relationship. Again, I'm, I'm person-centered in, in, in my core. So I look to Rogers. He speaks about a way of being. It is a way of being within that relationship. It's why you study for, for, for four or five years to be able to be there. So do we hold views? Do we hold our own truths? Yes, we do. Can we be unbiased? Well, it's about leaving that bias behind and taking 
that way of being into the therapeutic relationship and leaving your own personal uh, truths outside the door. Not easy, and they are there with you, but it's about being able to separate them, recognize them within the counseling room, take it to supervision again and again and again and again. Think about it, work about it, journal about it. Um, I think it's part of the excitement and and what, what we're asked of as counselors, as psychotherapists. Yes, and, and there's, you know, there's lots of books. There's Counselling Class and Politics, which is a really good book. You can Google that. talks about class. There's lots of different books. Um, and it's also about just thinking about, is your view of the world the only view? And that's I think that's a big challenge in personal development. You know, a lot of courses ask you to think about your history, about what you've been told through growing up. When I grew up, we still had maps of the empire. We still had Empire Day. My, my birthday mm-hmm. it was on Empire Day. Can you imagine that? Imagine walking around now saying it's it was considered a great thing. You know, Rory, your birthday's on Empire Day. Nowadays, you know, that's something you avoid. They do have it in, uh, they still celebrate it, I think, in uh, Bermuda, strangely enough. But um, so if I ever go to Bermuda for my holidays, <laughs> you can have your birthday and there. celebrate. <laughs> But yeah, and, and you know, as, as a country, we're having we're having those difficult conversations, and I think it's about take taking what you have what you have come from, and thinking about you know is it relevant to where we are now? And I think you know that's a ch- as you get older, I think that's a challenge because you're carrying more cultural baggage with you, you know, through the years. So it's worth just doing an audit and thinking. I wonder, I wonder if my view of the world, how my view of the world has been influenced, and actually. Is it the view of the world now that is is helpful when working with clients? Mm. So we need to move into practice matters. We could speak about this all day. Uh, My my final word on this, and I have to put this in because I'm a great Pink Floyd fan, uh, is there's a great uh, song by Pink Floyd called Us and Them, and it covers this topic in great detail. Fantastic lyrics. So we're looking at GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulation, recently introduced into the EU, and it basically uh, governs how we have to handle, store, share, or not share data and this affects practice rory it does um, and before you switch off if you're in a different country and think it's only for people the folks in europe and the uk actually i think you'll find that gdpr and and data protection is it's probably the same in your country if you, you know i know we have a lot of um, listeners in australia and new zealand and um well all over the world and Um, I think you'll find that there are data protection regulations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a data protection checklist. It's going to be generic. It's just going to be good practice. And I'm going to be talking about um, what you need to think about to protect your client's data and, in fact, protect you from prosecution because the fines under under the European law can be eye-watering if you're not careful. Practice Matters with Rory after this short message. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. If you are listening to this section of the podcast outside of the UK, please stay with me because as I will explain, the protection of individual data is a worldwide concern with many countries having their own data protection legislation. Australia has the Privacy Act of 1998. Uh, New Zealand has the Privacy Act uh, passed into law on the 5th of May 1993. And I came across an interesting headline published in July 28, 2018 in the Hindustan Times. Now, that is an English-speaking newspaper and it's one of India's most circulated newspapers. And one of the headlines observed, India moves closer to first data privacy law as Shrinsha panel submits report focusing on individual users' consent. Justice Shrinsha said privacy has become a burning issue and therefore every effort has to be made to protect data at any cost. In a world that's becoming smaller by the day due to technological advances, it's a fair bet that at some point data protection is going to be on your agenda. So how does data protection impact on us, those of us who are practicing counsellors? How does it impact on us? Well, the answer is more than you think. And what I've done is I've, I'm going to share my observations with you. They're, they're not, it doesn't constitute legal advice. It's rather my own interpretations. However, I have put a link in the handout to the Information Commissioner's Office. Those are the people who oversee 
data protection in the UK. And if you want specific clarification, get, get in contact with them. They're super helpful and they may be able to um, give you some information. So the first thing is that information that contains anything that could identify your client comes under the scope of the Act. And it might be a good time to remind ourselves why the original Data Protection Act came into legislation. And the reason for it was, was quite simply because in, in the late 1980s, someone found a whole pile of classified confidential medical records blowing on a, on a tip and a hospital had thrown them out. They'd literally just thrown them out and stuck them on the tip. And, or, or more to the point, their, their um, refuse people had stuck them onto a tip. And they were blowing around and you could just read people's private confidential information. And there was a real outcry at the time. And as a consequence of that, people said to the government, what are you going to do about it? And the original Data Protection Act was an answer to that. So that's the history of it, really. And identifiable information includes names, phone numbers, addresses, anything that could identify your client to a third party. Um, one of the things is clients have the right to access their records, including your notes, and they also have the right to amend or update information. And usually this would be usually confined to correcting errors such as date of birth, changes of address, contact information, um, changing to a married name maybe. Um, so they have the right to do that and also the right to know what information you have on them. Um, in a medical setting, and counselling comes under that to some extent, clients have a limited right to have information deleted. So if you're if you're signed up to an online retailer and um, you buy things offline, you can actually write to them and say, I want you to delete all my information off your company i don't want to exist in your company anymore and they will delete the information under law they have to it's slightly different in a medical setting and i'll give an example of why i have to keep notes for five years for my insurance company and um, if it's someone under the age of 18 five years after they become older than 18 but they get to 18 and five years after that so, you know, that could be up to, in some cases, 10 years for some therapists. If they're seeing a 15-year-old client, um, you know, it could be could be nine or 10 years in some cases. So that's that's the reason um, why there's a limited right, because in medical settings or in a business setting where you might have to have information for tax purposes, you have to you have to have it. You have to have clients information. Um, now, here is where we have to be very thoughtful. My next observation is carrying clients' data such as addresses or phone numbers on your personal mobile phone means you have to register with the ICO. Um, it's really interesting. If, as soon as you start to transport any client information on any device that you own, you're technically the data you're technically handling data or in some cases controlling it if you alter data and have the power to alter it you're a data controller either way you need to register with the ICO so it's never a good idea um, if certainly for a student counsellor to have clients information on your phone because technically um, you're handling that data and you need to register and you're also responsible for safe keeping it safe and due diligence um, so I've put a little list together of best practice for students. Always use your clients, your, your agency's phone number or computer systems to contact clients. So if you ever have to contact a client, use your agency's phone or their computer systems if you're writing a letter to them. Don't do it off your own because as soon as you're storing any data on your device, you're liable for it. And also your, your agency may have a policy about what data you can carry because technically... Even if you're volunteering, you work for them. Um, never have any client contact details or identifiable information written into any notes you store personally. So when I was a student, I used a split note system. The name, address, contact details were kept at the agency. The, agen the agency issued each client a unique serial number. That serial number went on my notes and my notes were written under that serial number. So if I lost my notes, all that people would find is, is, is my notes and a serial number, but they couldn't connect it to anybody because there's nothing there that would identify the client. 
And if you are storing client information on a personal device, such as a phone or tablet, you need to speak to your agency because they may have policies on data protection. And I, I give you, I'll give you an example of an observation that I made. I was on a train journey um, recently. I was sat next to someone who was using um, their laptop and they had um, a spreadsheet open which had a number of names and addresses on. Now, I, I don't know what that person did for a living, but I do know that I could lean over and if I was a kind of a nosy person, I could have had a very good look at the names and addresses and also got a good indication of what that person, person's work was. And I could have connected the two. That would have been a data breach. The other thing is, on my mobile phone, I use an Apple device. Even if my phone is locked, um, it's mine's, mine's I've got a password lock on it. Um, when the phone rings, it shows up whose name is ringing. <laughs> So even though I can't effectively answer it, um, it does show me whose name's ringing. And that could be a breach of data. If you're sat in a coffee shop and you've got your phone facing upwards and the phone rings and it says client Jenny Smith, um, that's effectively a data protection breach. So with all that in mind, if you uh, keep on the right side of that, try not to carry any per client personal data if you're a student bit different if you're a qualified practitioner you should be on the right side of the data protection legislation and i've put some links in the handout so please go to the handout which which points to a number of websites and also the information commissioner's office which um, is the place to go for any questions on data protection Thank you, as always, Rory. Really important link to legislation, something that we need to know and something I believe is being introduced into uh, the assignments uh, in the UK for, for counselling students. So really important. And get Rory's super duper handout on GDPR. But where do you get that from? Well, it's really easy. You just go to our website, which is counsellingtutor.com. Uh, on our website, counsellingtutor.com, you click on the top menu bar on the podcast tab, navigate to episode 94. For all of the back catalogue of podcasts are there, so you can listen to those while you're there. But go to 94, all the show notes for today, including any links we may have mentioned or thought of after uh, the show will be on that page. And you can download Rory's handout free of charge from that page just by putting in your email address and we will send it to you. Of course, if you are already a member of our paid for service, which is called the Counseling Study Resource, well, that handout has already been added to your handouts vault. Just log in. It is there for you. But me moving on, and we're looking at feeling judged by a personal therapist with, with the need for a counselling student, psychotherapy student to go for their own counselling. Um, sometimes we hear on our Facebook page, there is talk of, I feel that I might be being judged. And it's really interesting because I think it ties nicely into the topic that we actually started uh, episode 94 with a nice follow on there. What's your thoughts on that, Rory? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that's come up in the Facebook group a couple of times, but it's also, in, in my experience of teaching, feedback that I've had from students. And who said, you know, I'm, I've, I've, you know, I've been for my personal therapy and I feel, felt judged. And um, my, res my response, as, as always, is, um, who's paying for this therapy? And, uh, and they said, well, I am. And I said, well, that makes you a customer. So you tell them, you know, and I, I think that sometimes that, that, saying you know i feel in the last session of you judge me can take take um you on a journey of a real investigation into what's going on in the relationship and and sometimes it can be miscommunication you know sometimes we have different frames of references someone might say something to you and someone may take something away that's completely different but unless unless somebody actually says to the therapist i feel a little judged here and this is why then there's nothing to work with. It just it just stays in that person, and I think I think that if you're you know paying for, even if you're not paying for therapy, quite frankly, you may be guessing it free. Um, is to say I, I feel judged and explore that. That's a rich seam between you and your therapist to explore. And a good therapist, I think, should respond by saying, "Okay, let's let's look at that. Mm. Let's let's examine that." Um, because sometimes miscommunication and misattunement, as our friends in the TA world sometimes uh, talk about, misattunement um, can 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 cause both the therapist and the client to withdraw, and there's this big chasm there of nothing happening. And I think that 
that's not useful. It should be a great experience, your own therapy. It should be an affirming experience that allows you to kind of audit yourself and see where you are in the world. Mm. Very, very, very much so. And 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 this, you're going for for therapy, personal therapy, anything that you're experiencing. Um, you therefore your own therapy, but you can also look at it from how how will it be or how might it be for for my clients when they come and see me. And I know that I've certainly had uh, clients presenting to me in my private practice who have mentioned that they have at times seen other therapists and felt they were being judged. What is it that is causing that? What is it that that is happening? And uh, I, I guess within if the, if you're the one feeling that, you get to do as you said, Rory, ask seek yes look what's going on here and, and dive into it and learn uh what what it what it is yes and I, i've realized we've got got to really to the end of the episode and i've not mentioned transference oh, so right. just better put it in <laughs> quick yeah quick so <laughs> so sometimes we get transference you know we, we sometimes we sometimes think that transference is just a one-way street it comes it comes from the client to the counsellor but sometimes our, you know we can be reminded of our therapist of someone in in our past we see in front of our therapist something they say triggers an emotion generated from the past and we could we could react with counter transference so you know i think that by actually that kind of thinking about that and speaking with your therapist being honest and and, to, and you're paying for it. After all, it's, you, you know, as I often say to my clients, you know, you're on the clock, as it were, you know, as, as the American taxi drivers say, you're, you're paying for the fare. Then, um, yeah, ex explore it. And sometimes I think sometimes it can be transferred. So I, I can say in my own practice that's happened on a couple of occasions through the year where we've examined a perception that I've been judgmental. And actually it turns out that I, something I said reminded the client of something that was said to them by someone in their past who in fact was judgmental mm -hmm. but by having that conversation and i welcome it it's allowed us to examine it and also examining what's actually going on in, in between us in, in, in the therapy room mm. you know it's uh, just call it call it out i like that and and look to the theory the the, the base modalities d don't contain judgment not none of the modalities ask of the counsellor to form a judgment. So judgment should not be in a counselling room. However, there is also another mechanism at play here, and we need. We, I think that this needs to be mentioned, and that is the, oh, I know what you're thinking. I said such and such a thing, and I bet they're thinking this and this and this. And it's about how much of that judgment is based in reality, because there is a tendency as human beings for us to consider what other people are thinking. Oh, Lots of people are looking at me. Oh, they're all probably thinking, uh, you haven't brushed your hair this morning. And I know I can relate to those kind of thoughts within self. Uh, I've certainly seen it in clients. And Rory, you've spoken about it. And I think in the lecture you mentioned when working with people who feel that people are looking at them all the time, you had a great technique of go and stand in front of a shop window and make like you're looking in the shop window but don't look at the reflection and have a look what are the other people doing and you're gonna see the people are just walking by getting on with their own light i think there's a there's a uh, a a word for it i think it's called spotlight something i can't remember it but where you feel you're under the spotlight everyone's thinking about you everyone's talking about you everyone is considering everything uh, that you say uh, so it's worth keeping keeping that in mind yeah, and and you know sometimes, you know let's call it as it is. I'm sure that sometimes that therapists can be judgmental. You know, sometimes people are just, you know, they're human. They, you know, we, we you know, as as they say in the Merchants of Venice, you know, prick me, do I not bleed? Tittle me, do I not laugh? Poison me, do I not die? Shakespeare for you, and um, and in fact, uh, you know, sometimes that happens. But it's all about the conversation. It's all about the interaction. So don't you know if you're paying for something you wouldn't you wouldn't put up with if you're buying something any service you wouldn't put up with it um, if if you if you felt that but it's always good to have that conversation and explore it I think I think if I hear that from a client then I, I, it's almost certainly it's a prelude to much deeper work. Hmm. I think that uh, just as we kind of leave this topic we come to the end of episode ninety four it's worth mentioning. Uh, that Rory, you did a, a lecture just recently that, that kind of really helps and parallels this on contracting because contracting is a great area 
to kind of lay out what is on offer uh, and discuss the boundaries uh, of, of the relationship. And if you are a member of the Counseling Study Resource, log in and go and check that out. It's uh, You'll find it under the lecture library. Go and have a look at the lecture on contracting because it's kind of where you lay out what is what is not on offer and um, a lot can be kind of covered in contracting to to um, what what is it to reduce uh, the feelings that somebody might be judged yeah absolutely and and also you know in a contract part of it is is, is you know the client having a voice you know yeah. saying you know equalizing the power that's 100%. it 100% well, it's been an absolutely brilliant podcast today, Ken. We 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 started off by talking about working with with difference and and how we may have what we may have to think about, and then we went on to talk about general data protection regulations and and general data protection it doesn't have to be in the UK; it could be anywhere in the world. And then we finished on um, you know what happens if you feel your therapist is judging you. Fantastic episode, and uh, as always, stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counselingtutor.com.